Uh, my name is Katie Mulligan, and I work with the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. Um, every January, we do Volcano Awareness Month, which is a big initiative of talks and guided walks around the island to promote uh, awareness of our volcanoes and associated hazards and recent activities. So uh, tonight, we have Nika Bennington, who's a research geophysicist with the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, and she's going to be talking about the um, deep earthquakes that have been happening beneath Pahala. Since um, 2019, there's been an increase, but they've been happening even earlier than that. So I'm um, very happy to have her here tonight, and thank you all for coming. Thanks for coming, everybody. It's nice to see so many people. Um, tonight, I'm going to be talking about some work that I've been doing with a group of other scientists, both at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, um, other centers within USGS, as well as the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, so all focused on this huge uptick in seismicity that we've seen in Pahala, particularly since 2019. Uh, so I thought I'd start by showing you guys how the amount of seismicity, the number of earthquakes in the area, has increased in the last 10 years. Um, well, we'll work through the car alarm. So I'm going to start with uh, this bottom panel on the right. This is called a histogram. And what it shows is for each point in time, you have a little rectangular box. And the height of that box, you can read across here on this vertical axis. And it's going to tell you how many earthquakes have been in occurring in Pahala for a single week for that point in time. So if we look up to about 2015, at that point, the Pahala area was seeing only about seven, maybe even less, earthquakes per week deep beneath the surface. So thinking between 13 and about 25 miles below the surface of this big Pahala region. Then in 2015 and 2016, you can see here these little, these little rectangles start to get a little higher. And suddenly, we were cruising at something like 20 or 30 earthquakes a week happening here, deep beneath this region. Finally, uh, as Katie alluded to, in 2019, we saw this huge escalation in activity. And if anyone here actually lives within this region, uh, you know this without me even showing this figure. By the time we got to mid-2020, there were something like 500 earthquakes happening between 15 and 25 miles beneath the surface here in a single week. To my knowledge, this is some of the highest rates of seismicity anywhere in the world. So pretty crazy dramatic stuff. This all peaked in late 2021 when we got to something as, as much as 800 earthquakes a week happening deep beneath Pahala. So truly remarkable. Um, now the good thing is that this activity has started to go down, and I've plotted here up to about a week ago. And now Pahala is experiencing about 200 earthquakes every week, between 15 and 24, 25 miles below the surface. So that is still a gigantic number of earthquakes happening. But the amount that we were experiencing even a couple years ago was truly remarkable. So now, what I'm really interested in is why are all these earthquakes happening here? This is an amazing rate of seismicity. So before I get into that, I thought I would just show spatially where these events are happening um, as we went in time in the last decade. So I'm just going to show little month-long periods of earthquakes and where they're happening on the Big Island. So this is in 2014. Within the Pahala region, only about 100 earthquakes in a whole month. So things were pretty quiet. By 2017, you start seeing a much denser clustering of earthquakes in the region. And I'll just toggle back and forth for you. You can look at where my, my pointer is. Oops, there we go. So pretty quiet, starting to get, just a few years later, starting to get more and more seismicity. If we go to 2019, when we saw that something like 40-fold increase in the number of earthquakes happening here, suddenly you can see this dense kind of pancake structure of earthquakes happening between about, um, between about, sorry, <laughs> between about 15 and 24 miles below the surface. Finally, in 2021, here's our peak. 
This is a huge amount of earthquakes happening for a single month in the area. And then finally, in 2022, this is um, sort of the end of the peak. You see still this dense cluster of earthquakes all across the region. And then finally here, I pulled just the last month of earthquakes. So things have gotten quieter for sure if we pan between, say, a year ago and now. But we still are seeing a tremendous amount of activity here. So I was also interested in figuring out what are the size or the magnitude of these earthquakes that people are feeling? So there's a ton of earthquakes happening down to magnitude zeros and all the way up to magnitude fours. But which are the ones that are really affecting people that they're taking note of? Uh, so I looked through what are called Did You Feel It? reports. And these are reports where people who have experienced an event can go online uh, and fill out how they experienced the earthquake. And basically, any earthquake that had three of those reports, I looked at the magnitude. And what I found was that uh, these events that I'm plotting here were the ones that really were ones people took note of. They were magnitude three and four earthquakes happening within the region. Um, and I guess at this point, I just want to encourage people, if you're feeling an earthquake and you live on the Big Island, please fill out one of these uh, Did You Feel It? reports. They're really important, not only for understanding how that earthquake you experienced affected the island, but they're also used for understanding if we have other earthquakes in the similar area, uh, we can kind of forecast what the island will, how the island will be affected based on your reports. So super important to do. I'd encourage everyone to do it if you have time. So see Katie at the end of the talk for where you can fill these out. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, I was also interested in these events that people kind of took note of. How did they experience the earthquakes? And I found it was a real range of um, experience. It could be as much as just someone sitting there and thinking, gosh, did something happen? Was there an earthquake? That's kind of the lower end of our intensity scale. Uh, and then on the other side, these events, some of the bigger ones, actually cause things like furniture to move, plaster to fall off walls, windows to break, things to fall out of your cabinets. Um, so it, it's a pretty big range, but uh, all of this is happening fairly frequently here relative to the rest of the island. Uh, so now I'm just using a histogram to plot how often people in Pahala are uh, feeling some of these bigger events. So these are the events that people actually kind of took notice of uh, as based on those Did You Feel It? reports. Uh, so you can see that you know, earlier on, pre-2019, there weren't a lot of events that affected the community in any way. Maybe one event every so often. Um, then in uh, mid-2018, there was kind of this uptick, several events within, say, a month that people took note of as kind of affecting them. However, then when we get into 2019, 2020, and onward, you see that there's a large number of earthquakes that people are being affected by. And again, that could just be you know, sitting in their house and just feeling a little rumble. Uh, or it might be something like some light damage happening. Um, so you know, these, uh, these Pahala events are having a big effect um, on our community uh, in terms of folks down here in Pahala. Uh, so because of that, we are really interested in understanding why these earthquakes are happening. Um, and what do they mean for the island at large? So here I'm just showing, these are a couple different studies that have been done on Pahala. Um, or excuse me, the bottom one is a study that was done in 2015 on Pahala. Uh, I'll get my pointer. Basically, it's taking these earthquakes that you see here in map view, so that's as if you were looking down on the island, and instead plotting them where they're located in depth under the ground that we're standing on. And if you plot these with depth, they form a line. So they just have a linear trend, as you can see here. And that connects from the south end of the island all the way to beneath Kilauea, very deep. So thinking like 
15 to 25 kilometers, uh, excuse me, miles below the surface. So one of the big questions is, what does this line of seismicity mean? And how is it possibly or possibly not co connected uh, to Kilauea? So in this study, they said, well, it's sort of interesting to note this south end of the island is where the hotspot is thought to come up. And around those depths is where we see the start of this Pahala seismicity, so kind of around here. And this seismicity keeps trending towards Kilauea. It's happening very deeply. So perhaps this particular line of earthquakes is acting as kind of a magma pathway towards Kilauea. So that was an hypothesis that these authors put forth. And then the other question was, this seismicity, these earthquakes, are terminating deep below Kilauea. So is it possible there's a connection if this area serves as sort of a magma pathway? Is there a connection between this area and Kilauea's shallow um, volcanic storage system? And I will say that study was one of the first to really start to look at all these earthquakes happening in Pahala. Uh, there's been a more recent study that's gotten quite a bit of press, uh, this paper by Wilding et al., uh, where they use some more novel methods that have come out in the last couple years or so uh, to identify even more earthquakes happening beneath Pahala. So here's a 3D picture of the region. And there's this big cloud here that's similar to this big cloud of earthquakes that are happening beneath Pahala, just in 3D. And what they saw were a bunch of earthquakes happening here kind of breaking into two types of earthquakes. They saw tons of these earthquakes called volcano tectonic events. And volcano tectonic events basically mean you're, brock, you're breaking rock. So you can think about if you were at a volcano and you saw these sorts of events, as you're trying to push magma through up to erupt, you're gonna have to open fractures and break rock to get that magma through. So, being able to see these sorts of events, of events is one clue that maybe there's magma moving along in some particular region. But you can also have these sorts of events for all sorts of things. You could have them in a fault zone in California, for example. So they don't definitively tell us that, oh, there's melt in this region. They're just one possible clue. The other type of uh, earthquake they saw were sort of hybrid events, so events that suggest movement of fluids uh, as you're breaking rock. But those were in much lower numbers. Um, so I would say the jury's sort of still out as to whether or not this region is acting as transport for magma from the hot spot uh, through this mantle region, so through this deep region. Additionally, this study suggested that uh, they found more earthquakes moving vertically towards Kilauea. And these earthquakes were of that type I was telling you about, these rock-breaking kind of events. So again, little clues that maybe this is a magma pathway into Kilauea from Pahala, um, but maybe not. More work needed to be done. So in this top left panel, I'm showing you the little triangles here. Those represent seismometers across the island of Hawaii. And those seismometers are recording really subtle changes in ground movement due to all sorts of things. It could be a truck coming by. Um, it could be a volcano erupting. It could be an earthquake happening. Uh, for myself, I'm a seismologist, so I'm always interested in looking at this data um, with regards to observing earthquakes. So you can see we have our big pocket of seismicity, all these earthquakes that happen deep beneath Pahala. And you can see that those are observed by only three seismometers across the Pahala region, so not many. The idea with seismology is the more instruments you have, the better that you can do locating both um, the type of earthquake that's occurring, so thinking about is it giving us clues about rock breaking, is it giving us clues about magma moving, um, but you can also the more seismometers you have, the more earthquakes you can find overall. So the idea is we wanted to densify this region to try and find more earthquakes and then to better understand 
the clues these earthquakes are giving us about what's happening beneath Pahala. So as I said, we have this really kind of sparse distribution of stations across Pahala, but given this tremendous amount of activity, we want to know more. There's our gap. And I'll just take a minute here to say, these permanent stations take a tremendous amount of time, effort, and money to deploy. Um, so the idea of putting tens or 20, 30, more stations here in terms of the same sort of setup that we have for our permanent stations is a tremendous effort. It would be incredibly difficult and incredibly costly. Luckily, technology has been developed that allows us to have new, quick, easy to deploy research seismometers. So these aren't the kind that we use at HVO where they're relaying back data in real time. But they are still very good at recording the ground motions happening due to all sorts of different earth signals, including earthquakes. Uh, and they're really small. So I have one here, actually. It weighs about six pounds. We throw a bunch of these in our backpacks. We hike around different areas that we're lucky enough to hike around, like Kau, um, around Pahala and Naalehu. And we set out these little seismometers for about three months. So here are some pictures. You can see they're really small, they're easy. Here's uh, Peter, one of our seismo uh, seismologists, deploying one. He jumped out of the helicopter and put one down in the caldera floor. They're just really easy to put out. And much like your own personal computer, they have a little hard drive on them. They record the data. We can pick them up when they're done and then use that to study the region. So this is great for us for trying to understand Pahala and, in fact, kind of the perfect way of doing it. So we bought at HVO about 80 of these, and we were able to deploy them across Pahala. So as I said, these triangles are the permanent stations that we deploy here um, in Hawaii. And then these little circles represent when we went out with these little guys and put them out across Pahala. And I would stop at this point and just say that every one of these dots was done only because of my uh, interfacing with folks in the community here. Uh, you all were able to help me find the best places to keep the instruments safe from animals, to get nice, quiet recording. Um, the people of this region were instrumental to this experiment. So these basically sat out for about three to four months and collected, well, because there's just so much earthquake activity here, these, these um, instruments probably collected something like 10,000 or more earthquakes in that time. It was, in a, it was a particularly active point. We were very lucky to have put these out when there was quite a bit of seismicity happening beneath Pahala. It was in, uh, so it was in summer of 2022 and fall of 2023, and the last seismometer got pulled in like December of last year. Yeah. Um, so we've now got our data set. It's gigantic. Uh, now we have a few different ways that we want to tackle looking at the data to try and really understand what's happening in Pahala and how it might relate to Kilauea or Mauna Loa. Uh, so we have three different methods, and I'll talk on all three. One is something called machine learning. One is called seismic tomography. And then finally, the third uh, is something called receiver function analysis. So to start, uh, we'll just talk a little bit about machine learning. So machine learning is something that's happening all around us in various disciplines. It's teaching computers to understand some particular um, behavior or some pattern recognition of any sort of, um, of any kind. So, Really, you know, in kind of broad details, the idea is we give the computer this wiggle here, let's say. And this is kind of a perfect example of what an earthquake looks like, particularly those rock-breaking types of earthquakes. So we feed the computer a bunch of these different examples of rock-breaking earthquakes that happen all over the world. And the computer takes that in and learns this is what an earthquake looks like. It then goes into the data set and starts to find pieces of data recorded by these little guys that look like that sort of data. And so it starts to find 
Maybe something that might be really small and previously undetected using current methods to identify earthquakes, and it's able to find all these small earthquakes. So suddenly we're able to find something like 40, 50 times more earthquakes in our data than we could with kind of uh, more old-fashioned methods. So what kind of earth signals are we looking for by teaching the computer what these earthquakes look like? So at the observatory, we are always looking at a few different types of signals. So the top left one marks ocean noise. This is our most common signal that we see all the time. So we're looking at something called a spectrogram, and you don't have to know too much about it. This axis, the vertical axis, shows frequency, and this horizontal axis shows time. And all you need to know is that for a really low frequency, we see lots of warm colors happening, and that means that all the Earth signals are arriving within that frequency band. And when we see these really low frequency Earth signals arriving, all this is showing is that the ocean swells are constantly pummeling the ocean floor. And that sort of drum beat is always being seen by our seismometers. And that is what the signal looks like. It's that interaction with the ocean floor. Then I was talking a lot about these rock breaking events, right? You have to fracture rock to get magma to move through it. These sorts of events look like this top right panel. So these little triangles of energy, these are called tectonic earthquakes. Another kind of signal that we see, um, very commonly we see this sort of signal when, say, Kilauea or Mauna Loa is, has begun erupting, uh, is something called volcanic tremor. And again, you don't need to know all the details, but just know uh, here, this is the 5 hertz frequency and below. You see these really warm signals. And that means we have a lot of Earth signal energy arriving within that frequency band. And all that band is telling us is that magma or steam, sort of all sorts of liquids, are moving through the subsurface. And then finally, the fourth signal we see uh, is sort of a hybrid of the tectonic earthquakes and the tremor. And it looks like kind of this hump here. And basically, it's representing when we're pushing magma or fluids through and breaking rocks. So it's very commonly seen leading up to a volcanic eruption. Now at Pahala, there's not going to be an eruption, but what we're interested in is if we have magma moving through the region really deep, 15 to say 24, 25 um, miles. Sorry, we always report in kilometers as scientists. So I'm really interested in seeing if I see tectonic earthquakes, volcanic tremor, or even hybrid events there occurring deep as clues for if uh, melt is moving deeply through Bahala, and then looking for these same sort of events in earthquakes we see that are moving from Pahala into that deep Kilauea system. So I've just put this up. This was that most recent study I talked about. Um, there was quite a bit of seismicity that they found right beneath Pahala, so this region here. We're going to be able to find even more seismicity, smaller events, and better characterizing the different types of earthquakes because we have so many stations out. And then additionally, we're hoping to start to fill in the gaps and see more earthquakes along this path to Kilauea and then vertically um, going towards Kilauea's volcanic system. So these are kind of our hopes and dreams for what we might see. Um, right now, we're processing all that data using the machine learning methods. And this is just to show how we've improved the network in order to really understand Pahala. So we've gone from just a few little seismometers covering the area to over something like 86 seismometers that recorded for about three to four months. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about seismic tomography. This is actually my specialty, so the one I can probably answer the most questions on. And the idea in seismic tomography is to take advantage of all these Earth signals that are generated by earthquakes and then travel through the Earth before arriving at seismometers at the surface. So this is a terribly busy figure, but it's just to show this example. This is uh, the Northridge earthquake. So it occurred shallowly within the upper crust of the Earth. And then you see all these different um, cyan lines here. 
And those re represent different kinds of Earth signals created by that earthquake. And each of those waves is traveling through different parts of the Earth and being affected by those different parts of the Earth. Well, those waves are then recorded on a seismometer, and we can take that data and start to solve for an image of the Earth based on these waves and how they were affected by different areas that they traveled through and sampled the Earth. Oh, and I should mention, I think what's really cool about seismology actually is that by, earthquakes are really the only kind of signal that we have that completely samples through the Earth. There is no other sam sort of signal we can use in science uh, that so well penetrates from the surface all the way through the core of the Earth. So um, if anybody wants to become a seismologist, let me know. <laughs> so here's a little cartoon um, from a paper about, gosh, 20 years ago. Our focus in this study is to see, OK, we have, we have our hot spot. We have our plume coming up at the south end of the island. How is that connected, possibly, to the rest of the island? We see this seismicity happening beneath us right now in Pahala. Is that a region of magma, sort of transport highway? And does it connect to Kilauea? Here in this cartoon, we have our island. We've got these little seismometers on the island. And then you see these little, these little lines. And these represent waves, earthquakes causing these waves that are traveling through the Earth and then arriving at the seismometer. So again, we're taking advantage of all these earthquakes and the paths that they, the, the signals they create travel through the Earth. And we're going to try to create an image of what it looks like below the surface at Pahala. And this is actually something that's sub really familiar to all of you. You just didn't know it. So the same sort of technology exists in the medical field, thinking of CAT scans and MRIs. Uh, in the case of a CAT scan, the person goes into this little circular um, apparatus. And instead of earthquakes, you have the machine shooting x-rays, lots of x-rays at the person from all different directions. And then there's something very similar to seismometers recording this data on the other side. And the person is sitting in the middle. So instead of the Earth with earthquakes traveling through and feeling the structure of the Earth, it's these x-rays traveling through a person and feeling the structure of a person. So instead of a picture of the Earth, in a CAT scan, we get a picture of a brain. But I'm a seismologist, so I'm interested in Pahala. So I'm going to take advantage of these earthquakes, the extraordinary number of earthquakes that have happened here. And I'm basically going to take a CAT scan of this area and try to figure out where is the melt stored and where is it going. And uh, one of my colleagues always says that seismic waves are great because they have been there and done that more completely than anywhere else. So here's an example of uh, seismic tomography. So what I do, what's near and dear to me. I have a little cartoon here. This star represents an earthquake. And as I've told you guys, the earthquake creates all sorts of Earth signals that travel through the Earth. These little guys at the surface are representing seismometers. So if there's nothing really slowing anything down in the subsurface, the wave created by an earthquake is going to travel really quickly to the seismometer. Now you see here, there's this little red area. That represents some sort of slowdown happening. So in our case, something like melt. Earth signals traveling through melt, once they hit melt, they go really slow through that melt. And so you can actually start to see that as you look at the seismic data that you observe on the surface. So I've done this sort of thing, seismic tomography, imaging of active Earth systems, including fault zones, volcanoes all over the world. Uh, and this example I'm showing is from Akmak Volcano in Alaska in the Aleutians. Much like our own Kilauea, it has a beautiful caldera. This one is about six miles across. And much like this experiment in Pahala, I put out instruments across the whole region to densely sample all the earthquakes happening there so that I could create a really 
nice image trying to capture where is the melt in this area, where is that magma. So underneath, this is the image that I created with my graduate student, DJ Miller, and all the red warm colors represent slowdowns. So remember I told you, when these earth signals from earthquakes encounter melt, they slow down and travel through. So you can see here, all the slow colors kind of form a U shape, and this is actually where we have melt stored at Akamak Volcano. So we're going to do the same exercise in Pahala, in that case not at a volcano, but down deep. So we're going to look down to 15, 24, maybe even 30 miles down, and start to image these magma pathways if they exist deep beneath Pahala. So this figure is just to show you we're going to take advantage of all that seismicity because these earthquakes are all creating waves that are sampling through different parts of the deep earth beneath the Pahala region, as well as up by Kilauea. So I'm really excited to see what we end up getting. Um, this is a work in progress, though. So maybe next year I can report on some images. That would be a nice, uh, happy ending. This is the final method that we're using for the data. It's something called receiver function analysis. Uh, this is done by one of our collaborators at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, uh, Dr. Helen Janiszewski. In this case, while I'm interested in the broad picture of where melt is stored and how it connects to Kilauea, Helen's work more focuses on really fine details. So basically as if you were to slice a piece of cake through the earth and look really discreetly at what the structure looks like for that small sort of piece of cake. So I've circled in red here. We had this line of stations, these little guys separated only by about 100 meters or so each. And they form this line. And what Helen's work does is looking at the data along this line to get at the structure at more like tens to maybe 100 meter scale. So again, I'm interested in big picture. And then she's going to complement it by giving me what's the structure and what's going on in Pahala at really small scale, but just for this little picture, this little slice through the region. This right panel here just shows kind of different thought experiments of what might come out. And the idea of Helen's work is to get a picture of how quickly or slowly seismic waves move through the subsurface due to perhaps uh, the Earth's crust and mantle with a sill superimposed in or without a sill. And the idea is, what is the structure that best captures the data that she's recorded on these stations? So this is a pretty busy figure, but it's just to show you the kind of data we collect. So each of these lines represents the seismic data collected at a particular node. So again, we're looking at really subtle ground motion due to some earthquake happening. Helen's work relies on using global earthquakes. Uh, so earthquakes happening all over the world that are larger and end up traveling through the earth and then coming really deeply into Pahala. So for her, she's looking really deep to really shallow on this really small slice through the region. So you can see here, I know it's very small, but you can see these kind of bright patches uh, on each uh, piece of data for each seismometer. So all the seismometers show this bright patch of energy arriving, and then later another patch and another patch, all coincident with one another uh, in time. And each of these represented, represents some sort of structure that's occurring in the subsurface. So what Helen does is take this data and use all sorts of mathematical models to understand what sort of structure we would expect the Earth to have so that it would predict data that matches the signals that we observed at the surface. This is sort of her work. I'm by no means a specialist, but I hope you've understood that the tomography will give us a broad picture of what's happening, and then this work will give us that finer detail to understand at a really small scale in a localized area uh, what's happening in terms of magmatic activity. That's all I have for you guys today, but again, I just wanted to pause and really thank everyone in Pahala, Naalehu, um, just the whole area, because everyone in the community was so integral to this research getting done. 
Um, I had folks who kept eyes on my stations for several months, made sure that if they looked like they had fallen over, they picked them up. They showed me the best places to put these stations. Um, overall, people were just a joy to work with here. And I hope I get to come back again soon to do more field work here. So just a big thank you to all you guys uh, in this area. I really appreciated it. So we have time for questions. So the question was the question was looking for if there was any relationship between seismicity in Pahala and uh, activity in Mauna Loa leading to the eruption. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we did not see any sort of um, correspondence between the two things. We didn't see any sort of uptick in seismicity within Pahala that then somehow statistically seemed to lead to activity in Mauna Loa. Um, the next step for us, this isn't really sort of the same thing as your question, but we are really interested in seeing if there is any sort of link in the patterns of seismicity from Pahala to Mauna Loa at all, uh, or if those are totally absent. Um, the paper that I had talked about a little bit speculated at it at this idea, but it was very limited amounts of seismicity, and really they were shallowing way southwest of Mauna Loa and at really deeper levels than any sort of magma storage. So right now I would say no to any sort of link. Yeah. are a lot more complicated than I thought they were. <laughs> and the whole going on at some level throughout the entire Hawaiian chain. Apparently the, what I read was that there's still a volcanic possibilities on Oahu. So the one question was, and correct me if I get this right or wrong, uh, kind of what size of earthquakes do we, do, do we feel? Because you said there seems to be kind of variability in, yeah, in that. At yeah. The so, yeah. Uh, you know, when we feel an earthquake, it's not only the magnitude of the event, but also the depth that it's at. And in fact, if you have a really deep four versus, say, a really shallow magnitude three in volcano, that three might do a lot more um, shaking for that area than that four that's much deeper. And that's because. The deeper those waves are, the more energy they lose as they come up to the surface. Uh, the second question you had was, I, I think basically just to paraphrase, uh, where on the Hawaiian Islands do we have volcanic activity? Uh, because there, why would there be hot spots coming up at certain places so, yeah, so to answer your question about what areas have and don't have volcanic activity, um, our island is the only volcanically active island. And in fact, the hotspot comes up beneath the big island. Um, at other periods of time long ago, the hotspot used to be beneath, you know, each of the different islands. But as the, you know, as the plates have moved, uh, where the hotspot come up, comes up has changed. In terms of, your question is a good one though, because when you see steam at the surface, you think, well, there must be something going on below. But the thing that can be very long lived is the heat that the volcano created even after that volcanic activity has long ceased. So you'll see even on the mainland areas that were once volcanically active, but no longer active, still have geothermal pools, hot springs, these sorts of things. Um, and that's sort of the remnant heat signature from that past volcanic activity. Oh, that's interesting, thanks. Yeah, of course. OK, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Has there been any trend in the development where we have periods of high activity and then quiescence and starting over? So the question was if there was a change in depth of these Pahala earthquakes as this swarm has progressed since 2019 or 2015. And then your follow-up question was, have we seen this sort of uh, swarm activity at Pahala in the past? So your first question, these events are remarkably repeating. They really stick to about 15 to 24 miles below the surface. 
They are constantly happening in these same locations. And um, if, I, I don't know if you got here for the first part of the talk, but as I moved through time showing where these events were happening, uh, from one year to the next, you just see this, you see earthquakes kind of happening in the same sort of pancake region. Um, in terms of if this sort of swarm activity has happened before, um, I, I'm not sure. This is, you know, with the advent of better uh, instrumentation and being able to um, observe seismicity, I think we start to see things that maybe have or haven't happened in the past, but we don't have the data to answer that question. Yeah? Your reference to 14 to 25 miles, that depth is within the lava that's been put in place in the building of the island? Below it, that interface between the old crust and the island? Yeah, that's a good question. So there's a nice, um, you'll have to be patient. One second. OK. So there have been papers in the past, even I think as early as maybe the 70s or so, that, that identified uh, seismic tremor. So what I was talking about, that's kind of the, the thumbprints of magma movement. And that seismic tremor was seen sort of near the south end of the island, um, around the bottom end of where we see Pahala seismicity. So thinking like 24, 25 miles below the surface and below that. And so the sort of interesting thing was that as this Pahala seismicity has picked up, these studies have seen that it is located above where this deep tremor thought to represent magma coming up from the hot spot on the south end of the island was. So it's kind of at the top of that, like a little lid. And so that's why it draws the question, is this seismicity beneath Pahala some sort of magma transport, magma highway, uh, for magma coming from this deeper hotspot region. I think you had your hand up for a little while. Yeah. Um, I, if since moving to this island, you know, we've felt all different types of earthquakes. And this is a reference to the 5.1. Mm, yeah. yeah. I, I didn't feel it, but I noticed that the bird cage was moving and the uh -huh. bell on top as well. And I checked the time because I was doing something else. So I'm not sure why I didn't feel it, but I saw the result. <laughs> <laughs> and I did check. I was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's a five point one. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think your question was kind of on uh, experiencing different earthquakes. Yeah. And I don't know why you didn't feel the five. I will say that five was one, you know, I showed that scale of how people felt experienced earthquakes of different magnitude. That magnitude five that happened was quite shallow, quite a bit more shallow than the earthquakes that we see here in Pahala. Uh, so it did give the island a pretty good shake. And yeah, a lot of people saw uh, the movement of yeah. furniture and stuff like that. Didn't Maybe. Even, I didn't see it move, it was just a bird cage. Yeah, oh. the bird cage, always look at the bird cage. <laughs> <laughs> What, Katie? Oh, OK. Thank you. So you guys are asking about earthquakes that ha are happening between Mauna Loa and Kilauea. Uh, these are earthquakes that are accommodating the stresses from our volcanoes inflating and deflating. So if I push on something, it's going to stress it, and it's going to cause earthquakes in that area. And since that area is feeling the stress of two different volcanoes, one on each side, we get a lot of earthquakes in that area. Yeah, so you were asking why the depths were reported as negative. Those depths are reported with respect to sea level, and Kilauea sits 4,000 feet above sea level. So a negative depth just means that it's happening above the elevation of the coast, let's say. So you're asking if the, the current inflation rate is of the same level or greater than the 2018 eruption. Yeah. 2018, yeah. It's a really good question. <laughs> Let's come up here so I can hear. Yes, please. Can hear. Um, so that, that's a really good question. And so the shallow earthquakes you're talking about, is that working? Yeah. And, and the inflation. So it's a, 
I, I think it's great because it complements Ninfa's talk because all of these earthquakes that she's been describing here in Pahala, they're really deep down. Um, and that's very different from the kinds of earthquakes that you're asking about now, which as you said, as you heard on the news, is very, very shallow. And so it's a different kind of process that's happening. The ones that there was that period that goes on for hours, we'll call that a seismic swarm. And we've actually had a, a series of seismic swarms starting since October 4th of last year. And uh, so typically what we saw throughout most of last year, it's hard to believe it's 2024 already, but throughout 2023, you might remember uh, we started Mauna Loa, I had just quit erupting, as did Kilauea. And then earthquakes started building up again, very shallow earthquakes beneath the summit of Kilauea. They ramped up, we had an eruption, lasted a few months, stopped, very quiet, hardly any earthquakes. Then we started getting earthquake swarms, and we had another eruption in June, and it stopped, very quiet. Earthquakes ramped up again in September, very quiet, very quiet, and all of a sudden in October, it just went crazy with these earthquake swarms. And they'll last for hours at a time, sometimes overnight, sometimes less. And what's happening is there's an intrusion of magma happening uh, at Kilauea Summit and south of Kilauea Summit. And the earthquakes extend out towards the southwest rift zone of Kilauea, although technically they're not going down the rift zone yet. And so magma is coming up and being, it's, it's the, we call it an intrusion, it's intruding into that region. It's pushing the ground up as it inflates. And so we see that with GPS, we see it with our tilt meters, if you've seen our website, you see the satellite radar. And so that intrusion is happening and we get, when the ground is moving and cracking, like Ninfa said, it makes all these little earthquakes. And so we have these earthquake swarms that accompany that. And we've been seeing those for the last couple of months since October. Um, and so we, at some point, it will probably lead to an eruption at Kilauea Summit. But there's other possibilities, like maybe an eruption outside of the summit, down in the Ka'u Desert towards the southwest, all within Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. So uh, it'd be still within the park down there. Um, or what we've seen in the past, we've seen patterns like this and it just stops and goes away. Um, but so it's a really good question and you're right, we're seeing the most inflation that we've seen since 2018. And it's associated with this intrusion going on, very shallow earthquakes associated with that at Kilauea Summit, um, which is very fascinating, uh, very different from the types of earthquakes below Pahala. So here in Pahala, like Nifa said, we're not worried about lava coming out underneath. Um, it's a reasonable thing to wonder about because you feel all these earthquakes down here. Um, but in terms of the structure, as Nifa has shown, it's so far down, it's a different kind of earthquake and signal that we're seeing. So it's a really good question and ties into all the good stuff Nifa has told us about. Yes. Uh, miles. miles below the surface. You're not talking about the surface we're standing on. You're talking about at sea level. Um, well, so for Pahala, we don't have an extensive amount of topography relative to places like Kilauea and Mauna Loa. So, um, yeah, I don't know the exact elevation here in Pahala, but figuring uh, whatever the elevation is here plus 15 to 24 miles below that. <laughs> or whatever, yeah, I, I can't remember the elevation here right now, but yeah. And so a negative would be above sea level. Negative is just above sea level. Yeah. So are you trying to do research to see if there's a correlation between the magma flows below Mahala and Kilauea's eruption? So there's a kind of a couple different aims to this research. One is even just to verify if there is magma moving along these earthquake, this, these depths of these earthquakes at Pahala, uh, or if there's some other reason for them. Okay, let's say if we have confirmed that, okay, you know, through the tomography, through looking at the characteristics of the earthquakes happening here, if it seems to point to the signature of magma moving along, then the next strong area of interest for us is if we see evidence that it is connected physically to deep Kilauea. Uh, so that would be the next thing. Do we see evidence that 
that magma moves up vertically to Kilauea's shallow system. Um, once, you know, we have to get through those hurdles first before we even consider if there's any sort of actual physical connection between upticks in seismicity at Pahala and volcanism at Kilauea or volcanism at Mauna Loa. Right now, we don't see any obvious patterns at a statistical level that suggest a link. Yeah? I'm a little confused on the difference between a rift and a fault. Could you clarify that? Uh, so we have our rift zones where magma is coming up and actively pushing apart the subsurface. And then um, a fault zone could be any sort of mechanism uh, to move two pieces of rock that abut one another. So things like the San Andreas, where you have movement laterally, just kind of along. Uh, one, you know, you can have one side of one kind of geologic unit pushing up relative to the other or down. <laughs> So for, for us here in Hawaii, uh, when we're talking about rift systems, we're talking about regions of magma storage along the flanks of our volcanoes. Yeah, so I, I showed a picture earlier, and I'll just go to it real quick. So let's go back a little bit more. So this is the Pahala area. We have three permanent stations within this region. Oh, and sorry, to repeat the question, how many stations do we have in Pahala? Other questions or otherwise we can chat up here and if folks want to come up at the end, they can see our new tiny instruments. Yeah. Where have where collected these from? Will you put them next? Uh, so they've already lived another research life. They went to the floor of Kilauea and we also deployed another um, 1,700 or so of instruments like this across the whole of the summit. This summer we did that. And then we brought something called a vibrosize truck. Uh, it's a truck that has like a little loading plate and creates essentially like uh, synthetic earthquakes. So tiny earthquakes um, with its loading plate. And we had it run in kind of a circle around Kilauea Summit and then recorded that data so that we can model Kilauea in really, really fine detail. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.